Hi again. You're still here. <laughs> I'm still it's, here. It's shocking. I to mean. talk about <laughs> is, is culture the successor to evolution? Yeah. Um, in Hebrew, we both know Hebrew, so culture in Hebrew has two different terms. One is tarbit, when you talk about a culture of, say, germs. And one is tarbut, which is the culture of, of uh, culture. Of, of, uh, of higher organisms. Higher like us, organisms. Like us. <laughs> so I, I assume you talk about culture, the, the, the outcome of the minds of higher organisms. Yes. And there is an addendum. Are we headed towards a transhumanist future? Mm. Okay. So this is, there is this uh, relatively new theory. It's called dual inheritance theory or gene culture co-evolutionary theory, or in short, co-evolution. It's the idea that all organisms um, develop through a process of genetic biological uh, kind of adaptation. And that's a classic Darwinian concept, adapted <laughs> and evolved, but still it is grounded in genetics and biology. So organisms from microbes to chimpanzees develop only. So this is when I brought up tarbit. This is this, this is, is the, kind of yes. this is the realm. So this is uh, with with allegedly uh, one exception, and the only exception is the human human being. The human being develops both genetically and biologically, but it has another way of evolving, and that is culture or civilization. Human human civilization is actually a form of evolution. That's how it started. That's how this theory started. But then later, it was discovered that many, many species also have cultures, okay. societies at least. We know about the bees. We know about, from bees to, to gorillas. I mean, gorillas, we know about. Dolphins, ants, elephants, ants. elephants. Uh, I mean, so, it's beginning to be actually a theory of evolution, not a theory of human evolution, but a theory of evolution, which I think has the, the potential to supplant, to substitute for Darwin's evolution. Because Darwin limited himself to biology and genetics. And I, I think it was, it's partial. And because it's partial, I think it's wrong. Uh, if we talk about Darwin, I would like to know if you, if you, um take in with Darwin's theories some Lamarckist theories that... that I'll come to that, yes. Okay. okay. Yes, yeah, it's a good question because this is what culture is all about. I'll come to that. What is culture? When I say culture, first of all, to define the terms, when I say culture, I don't mean Kultur, like in German, I don't mean... I, but I mean the totality of human, human um, creativity. So that would be society, that would be technology, that would be art, that would be. I, I didn't. I didn't quite uh, think that Kultur meant some. Uh, Kultur mm -hmm. in German meant something else than culture. Kultur is only music and, and exactly. Kultur is limited. Yes. And, Kultur so weiter, is a limited and, so and that's why I'm. I'm, I'm clarifying. Okay. And what I mean is also the way, the way human societies are organized. What I mean is also technology. What I mean is also science. What I mean is also religion and also, and also and also. You could say civilization? Maybe? Creativity. Creativity. Civilization is, 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 a good, is a good term, but again it's associated with some, with some writings with some in the 19th century that again is a bit, a bit problematic. Okay. So we don't have a good word. We don't have a good word to describe the totality of human creativity. Because human creates in a variety of ways. The human creates with physical objects, with ideas, with social structures. It's all creativity. We don't have uh, create space <laughs> or some word to... So I'm using culture, for, for lack of a better word. Okay. But it means all... So what is culture in this sense? It's a simulation. It's, culture, is, culture is an extension of the brains and minds of multiple individuals. And when I extend my mind and you inhabit it, and I invite you into my mind, I'm actually inviting you into a simulation because it's not your mind. If I construct a building and then I invite you for the inauguration of the building, 
I'm inviting you into my brainchild. I'm inviting you into my fantasy. What my we're brain. doing today is exactly yeah. that. Yeah. You invited me to Skopje. Exactly. You said, come to Skopje. Yeah. We, we would like to talk about this, this, this and that. Yeah. So I came and I yeah. actually joined you. You in, are in my in, reality In now. your world. Yes, you are in my reality now. Similarly, if I write a book and you read this book, you're in my mind. Definitely. You're, yes. ca you're a captive I, of my mind. I'm becoming you. Yes, you're a captive of my mind. Same with movies, same with uh, computer programs. Same. So, culture, the sum total of human creativity, is what we call a simulation. Because it's about inviting others into your the products of your brain, the products of your mind. This is very important because it means that evolution has a physical manifestation but also a mental manifestation. If we say culture, it's very easy to mistake culture for tables and buildings and sculptures, but no. Culture is any human fantasy, any, any brainchild, any eruption of the mind. Any, uh, so, culture is an abstract thing. It's a, it's a, so, it seems that evolution is evolving both physically and mentally, which brings us back to the cycle, to the to the to the initial conversation we had about body mind, the body mind problem. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, why, how could mental processes, as reified in culture, how could mental processes have evolutionary implications? It's very simple. If I create an environment through my mind, if my, the first there's an idea in my mind, a fantasy in my mind. Like cities, we mentioned cities. 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 A city. Yeah. Cities, uh, the metaverse, computer programs, I mean, books, whatever. If I create something and then I invite you in, for you to inhabit that space, you need to adapt. You must adapt. If I create a city, you must adapt to the city. You can walk only in certain ways. You can buy food only there. You have to be physically less fit than a farmer. You, so it affects your body. Not only your mind, but also your body. It has effects on your body. To cut a long story short, culture is an environment exactly like an ecosystem. So it exerts what we call selective pressure. Culture. Culture creates natural selection. If, if you can't use computers, for example, imagine that you are someone who is technophobe and you can't use computers. You are seriously handicapped. You are today, definitely. Seriously handicapped. So computers, computers are not genes, computers are not chromosomes, computers are not the body. So Darwin, Darwin's work is broken there. It doesn't apply to computers. But I think that computers today are as important as your genetics. For you to survive in the environment as it is, you need to adapt to use computers. And if you don't, you're seriously disabled. Take a, take a phone. Yeah. Who doesn't have a phone? Yeah. Children. So, and if you don't, you're seriously disabled. So this creates selective pressure. People who can use phones and technology are more likely to get to have children. It's extremely simple. Why? Because if you are not, if you can't use technology, you are likely to have lower level of education, much lower level of income. These are predictors of reproduction. Mm -hmm. You are likely to adapt less to the environment. You are likely to be also treated badly by society, you're likely to be shunned and mocked and... And what woman would go with you? Right. To be honest. <laughs> right. I mean, imagine that you're on a date. You're going on a date with a woman. What's your phone number? What's your phone number? I don't I use don't phones. I don't have a phone. Number. You don't have a phone? You don't use phones? No. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you for you. the... Thank you for the drink, you know. It was nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. It's very simple. If you are not adapted to your culture and to the technology and to society, then your chances to reproduce are lower. So people who are not adaptive in this sense will have fewer offspring. <laughs> That's a great description of natural selection. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Moreover, if I 
am embedded in a certain society or culture or environment or technology or whatever, it activates some of my genes. We call it gene expression. Most genes are dormant, they're asleep, they're hibernating, and they're triggered by the environment. You, you mean each, each cell in our body has genes? Yes. So they all sleep? Not all, but majority do. Yeah. They, they sleep? They sleep. Okay. They and then the environment provokes them. That's why we get cancer. When there is pollution, you get cancer because it triggers some genes. So gene expression is triggered by the environment. That's acceptable in, in all biology and so on. So when the environment, but hitherto, they were saying that gene expression, genes, are triggered by f the physical environment, like the radiation, quality, quality of the air, radiation, this, that. It's not true. Genes are reactive to anything in the environment. To so happiness, for instance? To, to, to well-being? To social demands, to, to technology. To genes react to everything. Genes don't make a distinction between a tree and a smartphone. It's not that genes say, wait a minute, smartphone uh, is artificial, I'm not going to react to it. <laughs> they react. Yes. In other words, culture triggers your genes. And this is passed on. It is passed on to future generations. So this it's is hereditary. This is Lamarckism. This is epigenetics. Epigenetics is a variant of Lamarckism, which, which incorporates most of evolution, incorporates big tenets of evolution, but says that genes which are triggered are likely to, more likely to be passed on to future generations. In other words, your culture, your society, your technology shape you and shape your children as well. So definitely it's part of evolution, <laughs> no question about it. This is why we see small toddlers being able to do things that we, we didn't think that children can do. Definitely, because they, we they have come into a world that already has all these things that we, that we grew up with or ended up growing uh, up with and, and they are already born into this world and they, they use the technology much easier than we do. It's an excellent example because it applies to all, the, all life forms. For example, if you take a worm, a worm, okay. you know, tolat. Tolat. you take a worm and you put it in a maze in a maze, and there's food at the end. So the worm uh, goes me to the maze. Meanders. Meanders until she gets to the food and eats it. And she does it once and twice and three times, oh, four hundred times. The, 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 it's, because it's tolat, it's, it's a female It's worm. a female in Hebrew, yeah. yeah. Don't, don't say it's not gender bias. Yeah. Eat. Eat. It, it meanders and it eats the, the food. The offspring of the worm do it much faster. The, the first worm needs four hundred attempts to get to the food. It goes through the maze, it bangs into a wall, it goes back, it tries again. Really? And it needs 400 attempts wow. to get to the food. The offspring of that worm needs 100 attempts. And as we proceed in the generations, there are finally worms that just go straight for the food. Wow. That's, Unbelievable. Yeah. So clearly, uh, the maze is not a gene, it's not a chromosome. It's not biological, it's culture, it's environment, it's an artificial structure, someone's brainchild. The worm adapted to it and transferred this and this triggered in her, in it, some genes. And she passed on these genes to her children, wow. to her offspring. Unbelievable. And they are much better at doing this, at the task. And this applies to all life forms. So absolutely culture is an evolutionary force in two ways. One. If you are not adapted to culture, you are less likely to have offspring. Because, you know, no one will date you, no one yes, will have children with we, you, we because you're an idiot, we'll you don't use that. smartphones. Yeah. Yes. And the second reason is, your genes are activated and expressed, and they are passed on to future offspring. So, you could say that culture is a way to adapt to diverse habitats. Because human beings are not limited, to genetic or biological heritage, hereditary mechanism, but they can invent their own hereditary mechanism. I didn't get that. I will explain. Okay. If you are a giraffe, okay. your way to evolve as a species, your way to pass on properties and traits to your offspring, 
is sex, essentially. I mean, there's nothing much more you can do. You're a giraffe. And so consequently, you are usually limited to a specific habitat. Because you would find it difficult to survive in the polar, in the polar region. Exactly. Right. Uh, just like, if we mentioned Lamarck, we'll just say that Lamarck uh, had this hypothesis that a giraffe has a, a, longer, uh, a, a longer neck because it strives to reach yeah. the, that the... Has been, that has been disproved. The, probably the higher fruit. That has been disproved because uh, it's a not needed assumption because probably giraffes with higher necks uh, simply reproduce more. So you're in this sense, so you're, you're more uh, Darwin. Darwinistic. There's no need for, the, for this type of Lamarckism. But clearly, uh, if the environment changes suddenly, and trees become uh, uh, smaller. smaller, then clearly um, there would be some kind of adaptation to the environment somehow, which will be transferred to offspring, and that's where Lamarck is. So you see, yeah. I think you, you tend to agree with Lamarck more than not you fully, no, 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 not fully. Uh, the mechanism is Darwinian, in the sense that the, there will be giraffes uh, which will die and giraffes which will survive. And the giraffes that survive are better adapted to the environment, so they pass on their genes to their... So this is totally Darwinian. Okay, that's Darwinian. That's Darwinian. But what I'm saying is there is a place for Lamarckism in epigenetics, in the sense that the giraffes who lower their necks to eat from the smaller trees, this activates in them some genes. Mm -hmm. And through the Darwinian mechanism of heritage, they will transfer these genes onwards. Okay. So. Ironically, Lamarck is correct within one generation, but not between generations. Lamarck is correct in one generation, but Darwin is correct between generations. So Lamarck is right, the genes change within a generation. Darwin is right, that these genes are passed on. So what Lamarck didn't know is that the genes are being activated? Yes, he, he, of course he didn't know about genes, but he was right that genes, the genetic composition of animals changes, changes within reactive one's, within one within generation. Within the span of one's life. One generation. Uh -huh. He was wrong about how this change is transmitted. So that's where he was wrong. I see. But he was right that such that there are changes within one, gen one generation where Darwin was wrong. Darwin said no. Change is only intergeneration. Yes, you have what you have. Yeah, you have what you have, and it's intergeneration. Okay, so they're both so right in cer certain senses. They're both senses. right, yes. So, mutations and genetic expression can happen in a single generation and alter the species substantially. And this alteration is then tr passed on to future generations, as Darwin had said. So, but uh, humans went a step further. Humans said, Humans said, we are going to design our evolution. Uh, giraffes are limited, you know, to epigenetics and to Darwinian transfer of genes. Women said, no, we are going to design environments that will then affect our genes, that will then allow us to better adapt in future generations. So what, what humans are doing, they are designing environments, then they are reacting to this environment epigenetically, then they're transferring it to the offspring. But you said training. women are doing that? Oh, humans, humans. Oh, humans. Okay. Humans design environments that then affect their genes epigenetically, yes. and then they transfer them to offspring. Okay. So humans trigger their own evolution. In a way, you could say that humans are in control of the evolutionary process. Absolutely. In control. And that's why the fact that humans control evolution through culture. Unwittingly, by the way, probably. Uh, until now. Now it's, it's pretty wittingly, but before that, yes. We didn't know about epigenetics until recently. Yes. But because we control evolution through an environment which is essentially artificial, essentially a simulation, because we control this, then we can uh, survive in all habitats. We are not dependent on genes anymore. We, we, can, we can trigger the necessary genetic adaptation ourselves. We don't we, depend on it. We, we've seen this throughout history. When, when people who live in the Sahara 
uh, have have adapted to living there, and people who live uh, at the at the, yeah. on at the pole or close to the pole uh, uh, adapt to different temperatures and, and it's a question climate. Of it's a question of speed also. Uh, in a in a typical species, animal species, it would take tens of thousands to millions of years to adapt. To adapt. In human beings, it takes sometimes eight thousand years, which is. A lot, which is a lot, but no, less. but it's nothing in terms of uh, evolution. It's a, it's a heref. It's a, a moment. A moment. So humans adapt much faster, and they adapt much faster. They change much faster, and they change much faster because they control evolution through environment. Now there is this addendum which says, "Are we headed towards a transhumanist future?" What do you mean by that? Humanist, not in the sense of. Human, 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 uh, humanism or no, humanism? No, transhumanist uh, future implies that uh, in the future technologies will integrate seamlessly with human beings. So you will have, for example, combinations of artificial intelligence and your intelligence and you will be one. Like the chip you said like the chip would be implanted yeah. in your brain? It's an example. And so you will, we, will be, we will all become cyborgs. Cyborgs, combinations of technology and, and hitherto humans combined, combined into a single entity. That's one version of the transhumanist future. And transhumanism simply means humanity as it is today will cease to exist and be replaced with some kind of variants. Could be combination of humans and technology, could be only technology controlling humans, could be so. The uh, question is, will, will there be a danger of stratification, for instance, where mm. societies remain as, as they are, as we are, and others who have the means would um, turn themselves into Übermenschen? It's always the case that te technologies are first adopted by, by the rich, by the wealthy, and they have an advantage for a while. For example, smartphones were first adopted by businessmen, very wealthy people. So they had an advantage over you because they became much more mobile. And they but it was very short -lived. But it was short. So the, the hope is, and reality is, that, that, that because of the profit motive, because of capitalism, um, there is a strong urge and a strong uh, impetus, a strong incentive to make technology affordable. So. I believe that te these technologies will be widespread, but there is another, it could be, at the end result could be stratified, but between Luddites and, and uh, technophiles. So you could have groups of people. What's the first? Luddites, L-U-D-D-I-T-E-S. Luddites are people who reject technology. Uh -huh, okay. So for example, when the weaving, the weaving um, machine was invented by Hargreaves, Hargreaves in Britain, the automatic weaver, um, manual weavers of fabric destroyed these machines. Okay. So this is called Luddism. Anyhow, you could have in the future groups of people who would say, I would never ever put a chip in my head. Mm -hmm. And other groups of people would say, of course I want to put a chip in my head, it would make no, me a uh, uber uh, We see this now in yeah. anti-vaccination. Anti -vaccin exactly. We see, of course, uh, uh, people in in the United States of America who live uh, live in 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 the attire and in homes of the 18th century, yeah. and so and on. And survivalists who live in mountains and so on. Yes. So I that's a perfect example, because the technology will change the environment. You will have the, the possibility to insert a chip in your head. Those who reject this will be disadvantaged, because I will know every language in the world. I will have access to the Encyclopedia Britannica. I will make calculations in the speed of light. You will not, because you refuse to put a chip in your head. Who will women prefer to have children with? You or me? Oh, the, 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 the with it guy. Majority will go with me. There will be a tiny minority of women who are like you. They, they don't want to put a chip in their head. <laughs> yes. Right. Okay. But majority will go with me, with the likes of me. Yeah. So this will have a reproductive advantage. This is a perfect example of how culture continues evolution because then my children are much more likely to have a chip in the head. So a, a chip in the head humanity will be the next iteration, the next stage in evolution, driven by technology, not by genes. Technology is the principle of natural selection. It will be natural selection by culture. 
And this is what they mean when they say co-evolution. Ah, one last thing. Yes. It can go all right. It can go bad. We could have a process of negative selection. Or, for example, if society becomes a hell of a lot more narcissistic and a hell of a lot more psychopathic, as I believe it is will. the case, uh, is, is the case, not will, Already. is happening. I we believe see, we I, see it in leaders. Lately. Yes, in leaders, in, 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 in the population. For example, college students, the incidence of narcissism among college students is five times more than in the 80s. So, if society becomes more narcissistic and psychopathic, there will be a big temptation to use culture and technology and societal structures and institutions to subjugate, to bring about, yeah, a narcissistic, psychopathic world. It all depends on us which choices we make because we can shape our evolution as we see fit. As we see fit. We are gods in this sense. We are the only species that shapes his evolution with his own two hands. But we really were created in the image of God in this sense. We are creators. Now, other animals, they use tools and yes, they have societies. And, but I don't think any animal would reach the level of consciousness of realizing that it can shape its own future. This is only human beings. Yes. And they are bad human beings. They are evil human beings. There are. And there are more and more of them. And so it can, the whole process can go seriously all right, seriously bad. It's a warning.